<laughs> uh, you know, everything I know about the Vatican Bank, I learned from the movie Godfather 3, which, <laughs> which I think is a very underrated movie. I happen to be a big fan of that movie. But one thing I learned from your book that I didn't realize is that the Vatican Bank is actually very recent. Whenever you hear Vatican attached to something, you think, oh, it must go back to the 5th century. No, it goes back to what, World War II? Just to World War II. That's what yeah. I loved about this when I got into it is here you have a 2,000-year-old institution, and they were really Pope kings. They ran their own empires sure. for a long time. The Borgers, for those who oh. have seen the series, uh, they had 15,000 square miles of central Italy that was their empire. They levied sure. taxes, and then all of a sudden they lose that. Italy gets united, they get reduced to this little postage stamp piece of property, Vatican City. But their own sovereign country. But not yet. So in 1870, oh. they're not sovereign. They're just oh. then head of the Catholic religion, right, the right, biggest yeah. religion in the world. Then in 1929, Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy, hits an accord with them and says, I grant you sovereignty, your country, and they in turn support him. And that's what gives them sovereignty back. And then they have the rights as a country. And in the middle of World War II, the financial wizard who's running all of their money, because Mussolini gave them about a billion dollars to make up for the loss of the Papal States, creates the Vatican Bank right in 1942 because he knows that the British and American intelligence units are looking to stop countries like the Vatican, these mm. tiny little sovereigns, from doing business with the Nazis. So he says, if we have a bank, a cross between a central bank and a Wall Street investment bank, we're off the radar. They can't follow us. And that was the start of the bank that's been this scandal-ridden, plagued place. And it really was, I mean, I, I think from what I read in your book, that it was a lot about uh, the fact that they were looking to sort of get the pressure off them for not talking about the Holocaust. And I don't think people realize this. A lot of the Nazi hierarchy was Catholics. And the Catholic Church, if they had said something about the Holocaust, could have really changed history. They, there's a debate. People say if the Pope had spoken out, it would have made a difference. But this was a time in the 40s in which the Pope still carried that authoritarian weight that popes used to carry. If he had said it is a mortal sin for Catholics to kill Jews, of the 50,000 Nazis who administered the concentration camps, three quarters were Nazi, uh, were uh, Catholics. There were some who were also Lutherans in that, but the hierarchy was all Catholic. Uh, they revered the state, but the church was most afraid of the Bolsheviks, the Reds. And so what I find in this book is they did business with the Germans through the war. That shouldn't really be surprising. They did business with us. They were buying U.S. stocks, sure. they were putting gold here, they were buying real estate in London, but they also did business with the Nazis. So are you saying that religious people can do immoral things? <laughs> <laughs> See, that so doesn't sound right to so, me. So